Father, first of all, thank you that you give us relationship guides. Thank you that they're not laws and legalistic, but they're relational. And so as we continue this study on divine government, you getting us ready to rule and reign with you for a thousand years, and then whatever you've got for us in the ages to come. Lord, may we hear what you're saying, not just in our ears and in our intelligence, but in our spirit. And may the impartation and the sense of what we're sharing get into us and change us so we're ready for what you're about to do. We ask in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Now, one of the reasons I call this transitioning from church governance to kingdom governance is church governance has been a mess. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. And if it's been a mess, then we have not been doing it God's way. But man is very slow to realize that. And so what we're wanting to do is to show you how heaven is governed. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, if I don't study as it is in heaven, am I going to know how it ought to be on earth? And so that's the premise from which God started me here. We're catching glimpses of heaven's governance. And by the way, in everything God does, it's never all in one place, which is frustrating for humans. But see, God is pressing us into relationship. He's not pressing us into legalism. He's pressing us into relationship. And so here's what we've learned so far. God is king and rules supreme. Second of all, Satan, and catch this, because there are people who, who don't believe this, but if you're honest in daily life, you'll say this is so. Satan still has access to the heavenlies until Revelation 12. Okay? Satan is a restless spirit. So, and that's Job 1 and Job 2. I don't know why that other, is. there's no, uh, it's not Job 21. Four, God gives permission for the trial of his child. Nothing comes to you except by permission. That means God has confidence in the work he's done in you. Oh, I wish we could hear that way down deep inside. Because it would change our whole sense of what we're going through it would actually cause us to say, yay, thank God for the trial. I've got everything I need to go through this. Instead of, oh, and having a wine and cheese party. We whine and get cheesed off. All right. <laughs> God puts limitations on the enemy's testing of his children. Each time Satan went back to God, God put a limitation on the trial. There's a limitation on your trial whether you think so or not. Because <laughs> some days you don't think so, do you? I can't take any more and more piles on. And that's actually God saying, no, there's more I've done in you than you realize. And by my leaning on him, I can pass the test with a four-point average. All right? When God allows us to be trial, tried, it's because he has confidence in the work he's done in his child. 1 Corinthians 10 and 13. So we're going to look at another incident of heaven's governance. And this is probably the clearest one we'll see. And it messes with all our theology. I'm warning you ahead of time. God loves to mess with my theology. So it's 1 Kings 22, 19 to 23, and 2 Chronicles 18, 18 to 23. This is the most clear of all the passages concerning how the government of heaven operates. Remember, 
God is sovereign. This makes the way he chooses to govern even more amazing. So let's, we'll read the uh, First Kings passage in uh, First Kings 22, 19 to 23. And he said, now this is Micaiah, the prophet of God. He's actually a seer. He is relating what he is seeing, present progressive tense. He has been caught into the council of heaven. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So here we see God making a decision and God ruling in the affairs of men. And he does it kind of strange. And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the hosts of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner, another said on that manner. Verse 21, And there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? Now, folks, God didn't need to know how it was going to be done. Therefore, the reason God allowed this to be written is so you and I could see how heaven is governed. He doesn't have to tell us a thing. He is sovereign. But he wants us to see how heaven is governed so we can pray thy will be done on earth as it's already being done in heaven. What is going on today is already being done in heaven. Do I understand that fully? Absolutely not. Do I believe it? Yes. Okay? And there's a difference there. I'm not sure we have to understand. Let me say that again. I'm not sure we have to understand. Some of it is by faith. And God does not have to explain to me what he wants me to walk in faith in. Okay? And some days that frustrates me. Let me make that very clear. <laughs> Okay? And the Spirit said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And God said, Thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Now I want to read this portion also in Second Chronicles because it unveils a little more of how the enemy operates. How I many know we need to see from Scripture, not from experiences, but from Scripture, how the enemy operates? So in Second Chronicles 18.20, Then there came out a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will what? Oh. Does that unveil a little more of how he does it? I will entice him, and the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I'll go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his one spirit in the mouth of 400 or 850 prophets. One spirit. So if you cast out devils, cast that devil out, for 850 people would be free. <laughs> one spirit. I will go and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. Sometimes we underestimate the power of the enemy or the strength of the enemy. And when we do, we do it at our own peril. Now we do not, we're, it's not that we're afraid of the enemy, it's that we need to respect him and then we, he can't put anything over on us. He puts things over on us because we don't respect our enemy.
when we respect the enemy, we don't put anything past him. We understand his methods. That's We're going to look into that in a bit. But we understand his methods, and so we don't assume or presume anything. You know, if the United States assumed how many, uh, well, let's take U.S. and Russia, how, or China, how many, uh, where all of their uh, weapons were, and that they could fire and, de and deal with all the weapons, that would be a gross miscalculation. Because no country tells you how many they have. There's always a backup plan. But if you respect them, then you will not think that they're telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. They may be telling the whole lie and nothing but the lie. <laughs> All right. And, God, and the Lord said, Thou shalt entice him. Thou shalt entice him, and thou shalt also prevail. Go out and do even so. Isn't that interesting? So, but when the... Also, yes. Not only is the spirit allowed to go out and entice, but it sounds like he can only cast the power that God lets him have. That's right. He was delegated the power to deceive. Now there's there's another. Ah, <laughs> you know. When the council of heaven convenes, it's around the throne of God. There's a whole line of doctrine out there right now being taught on the councils of heaven. And it doesn't have a lot of scripture. And so I'm very cautious about it. I'm not saying there aren't councils, prophetic councils and patriarchal councils in heaven and all that stuff. Because I don't know. I haven't been there. Some people have. They have my envy and my jealousy. Uh, <laughs> but I've got to be able to find in Scripture where those things are. I would rather set up like David did, because you see David, and we'll look at this a little later, David got his pattern of government from God. And he changed the government and how Israel was governed because of that. Okay? Okay? So when the council of heaven convenes, it's around the throne of God. Second of all, the hosts of heaven, obviously both good and evil, are gathered around the throne. There's a shaker. But do I have scripture for it? Yes. Three, God determined that Ahab would fall at Ramoth Gilead. The outcome is never in doubt. God gives very clearly what he wants done. But the method is not necessarily decided. Hello? That's why the man whom God has given the vision for a work should never forsake the head of it. Now, he, he may go to other places. He may be called of God to cover other places. But the foundation or the mother assembly that God caused him to start, he should always have a hand in the outworking of the vision. Why? Because God gave him the vision and the vision flows from the one who received it. Okay, too many churches, and I'm talking about that God may have started, too many churches have let go the senior man. And when a new senior man comes, the vision changes. So you've got 
you know, we always got upset at the Russians and communists for having a five-year plan. Some churches only have a three-year plan because they change pastors every three years. Listen, this is a life work, not a job. This is not a career. This is a vocation. In other words, if you're called, you're called for life. Even if you mess up, you're still called for life. This is a life sentence. I mean, this is a... <laughs> Are you catching what I'm saying here? And if you're called to ministry, you won't be happy doing anything else. At one point, I went through a time where God shut everything down. And <laughs> my wife said to me, would you find a place to live or to, a place to minister you're miserable to live with? Because when you're called to ministry, you cannot be happy doing anything else. So I'm happy. <laughs> All right, let's not go down that, too far down that road. All right. <laughs> What was not decided was how it would be done. God asked, and this, this is, it blows my mind every time. God asked for suggestions. How are we going to do this? Even though he knew what the response would be. And again, I really feel that's because he wanted us to see how heaven governs. Number six, he entertained a number of suggestions and then decided which one would prevail. He released a lying spirit into the mouth of all the false prophets. A lying spirit, and this you need to hear this about a lying spirit, a lying spirit that was so convincing it overrode what the prophet of God said. Well, what did they have in and, and uh, Jehoshaphat do. They went to war anyway. Didn't they? When the prophet of God had told them exactly what would happen, they went anyway because they believed the lying spirits. After all, you know the majority is always right. If you believe that, you're a sucker. <laughs> The minority is always right, and the universe is ruled by a minority of three. <laughs> All right. One lying spirit. It's important to remember that lying spirits have the ability to convince even the ones lying that they're speaking the truth. You wonder how some Groups have arisen. How some moves of God have actually migrated into a cult. Because a lying spirit came in and convinced the top leader that he was something that he wasn't. A whole movement that I know of went into error because the top man was convinced that he was better than sliced bread, so to speak. And because they convinced him of that, he could be turned. And three witches over, took over the church. The church movement. It was a, a worldwide movement. Okay. One lying spirit possessed 850 prophets. 400 prophets of Baal and 450 prophets of Ashtoreth. In the First Kings passage, God said, Thou wilt persuade him and prevail also. In Second Chronicles passage, he said, Thou shalt entice him and thou shalt also prevail. God guaranteed the victory of the lying spirit. That is a... Talk about shake him up. <laughs> 
When a lying spirit takes over, even those who are doing the lying are convinced they're telling the truth. Two methods of the lying spirit are exposed in these passages. Persuasion by coercion and enticement or seduction. Sometimes they persuade. Sometimes they seduce. Okay? But that's two of the methods the lying spirits use. Now, it's essential to realize to see into the heavenlies this clearly is possible under the new covenant. Remember that our covenant is better. How can we bring his kingdom on earth if we don't see what's going on in heaven? Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So, Father, we need some glasses changed. We need to see more clearly because what God is doing is above and beyond what we have known. And in the end time, God is going to open heaven so we can see and produce heaven on earth. Okay? Now, Jeremiah 23 and 18 says, For who has stood in the counsel of the Lord and hath perceived his words and heard his words? Who hath marked his words and heard it? Number one, it is possible to stand in the counsel of the Lord. How do I know? Because my covenant is better than the old covenant. And Jeremiah and Micaiah and a number of the other prophets clearly stood in the counsel of God. Didn't they? Isn't that what it says? Well, is our covenant better or worse? If they could do it in the Old Covenant? See, we, we read the Old Testament, but we don't read the Old Testament. We think these folks were special, and they had something better than our covenant. Come on now. <laughs> Well, we either believe the Word or we don't. I prefer to believe the Word because that's the safer place to be. Amen? All right. When we do, when we, do we not only need to hear His Word, but we need to perceive its meaning. Remember that perception is a spiritual reality, not a natural reality. It's done by the Spirit not by the mind. And it comes from our spirit to our mind and communicates to our mind. But this is uh, perception and discernment are spiritual exercises. Spiritual giftings that God gives the ability to see beyond what's being said and being done. To see into the realm of the spirit what the real motivation is. And it says that in order, when I stand in the counsel of God, I need my perception activated. Do you know one of the reasons the church has got in such trouble is they've legalized what should have been perceived. Okay? If we judge from the obvious we will miss the meaning of what we hear at the throne. By the way, are we supposed to approach the throne of grace and find mercy? Well, don't you think we should listen when we're coming? Hmm? Our problem is we have been so afraid of approaching the throne wrong that we're not listening for what the Father is saying. 
If the Father, if we come to the throne, he wants to speak something into my being that will enable me to do what he's wanting me to do. But I get so caught up in needing grace that I don't hear a word that activates faith. You want me to say that again? I said I get so caught up in needing grace that I don't hear a word that activates faith because faith comes by hearing. If I don't hear, I don't get faith. I'm speaking. It te tells us in Hebrews that we can approach the throne of... Doesn't it? That's when I come. And I may come with a petition. I may come with a need. But do I stop long enough to hear what's going on around the throne? Or do I just unload my need and leave? You know, one of the things that I learned in studying the life of Jesus is that at the age of 12, he had all the uh, skills of a true counselor and teacher. D d turn for a moment there, if you've got your Bibles with you, whether they're electronic or the real thing. I mean, whether they're electronic <laughs> or otherwise. I've got to get everything else out of my Bible case to get my Bible. <laughs> Okay. Pardon me. Okay. Now, what was my last statement? I did. I said, what was my last statement? <laughs> Pardon me? Okay, yeah, let's turn to, that's an, in Luke, isn't it? Yes, I did ask the question, and it's my fault. <laughs> Verse 41 of Luke chapter 2. And now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew it not. By the way, keep track of your kids. All right. Uh, <laughs> but they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinfolks and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after th three days, they found him. I think Mama was worried, don't you? They found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors. Now listen carefully. Both hearing them, in other words, he knew how to listen, and he knew how to ask questions. Now these are all skills of a teacher, and a counselor, but a teacher. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and at his answers. In other words, he answered the questions that the doctors of the law asked him after he had asked their questions, asked them questions. By his answers, he revealed a knowledge that was unusual for a 12-year-old. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and his answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, Now catch this. How is it that you sought me? Wist ye not I must be about what? So he knew who his father was. And he knew what his father's business was. And he was doing his father's business. And he could have, from the age of 12 on, he could have 
moved in all of that. Now, because it will feed, we'll feed into this one later, let me go on and read the rest of that. And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. Catch these two verses. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was, what? Subject unto them. He submitted unto them even though he knew and had the power and authority to move in what he was called to. That's true submission. And his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature. Was it because he was willing to submit and wait God's timing? And in favor with God and with man. Are we hearing that? See, these are things we just pass over. Now, if I was teaching that from that passage, I'd go to the quote it is in Proverbs. Okay? So we need to hear what God is saying. When we come to the throne, we need to not just come with our need, and when our need is done, leave. We need to hear what's going on around the throne. We need to hear and perceive what God is doing. Because God's heart is that we come back from the throne and have a greater influence in our life and in our ministry. Okay? Can I have a question? Yes. Okay. And God calls us out to another ministry or something like that. Would God set us in a situation like that, even though, and I know this can be dangerous, where we might know more than the leaders, but God wants us to submit? Let me give you an illustration from my own life. Back in 1975, God called us to go to a ministry and live in Montreal in a house with 63 others. We had five children at the time, plus a visitor who had a baby as well. So we lived in one room with uh, one of our children went and slept somewhere else. The mother of the little baby went and slept in, in a, you know, in a, ladies dorm so we had five children in our bedroom and a dresser between us you talk about a hot house plus I worked nights all the other men worked days so some days I could sneak in and sneak upstairs and go to bed but if they caught me coming in the house after a night of work oh brother Bill can you One of the things I realized in that was that there are some areas that I knew more than the leaders, even the, net, the international leaders. Part of it because of the, my experience and my crying out to God, having been in very difficult situations. And if I didn't get an answer from God, I, was, I would have been toast. So either I got an answer from God or, you know, so when, when we went to the Christian community, which was a, a back-to-the-land farm-style situation, no running water, no electricity, uh, and all that stuff, you know, that good old back-to-the-land stuff, except that I was, never have been athletic and never have been strong. So <clears throat> anyway... 
The Lord said, whatever they say unto you, do it. And so as I did, and I walked in that, those on the land that, that were part of the congregation would begin to come to me. Okay? And they would see something in me that wasn't... By the way, there were 24 elders. I just want to let you know they weren't the ones around the throne. <laughs> But um, they would see something in us that wasn't in the others. We didn't tout our knowledge. We didn't tout our understanding. We didn't tout our experience. We just walked. And because we submitted to them, in that circumstance, we grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. I've done that several times in my ministry. And each time I grew. And I won't tell you what the reaction of the folks was, but I grew because I was willing to submit. Not because they demanded it, but because God said to. And that, by the way, we'll come to that further on, but submission the power and true authority of submission is in the submitter, not in the one they're submitting to. Okay? And we need to hear that because of all the... all the <clears throat> out there about authority and submission. We won't say what word I was going to say. Yes? But see, when and we'll come to this a little later in the, in the course, but when God is saying that, I first have to hear from him who to submit to. Then I trust him in them because he has said to submit. And if everything goes sour, he will care for me. He will take care of me because I have been in obedience in submitting in that uh, there's always a point where he says enough is enough. If they if they start going way off, he'll say enough is enough, and he will extract me. Okay, but when he tells me to go somewhere and submit, like coming here, it isn't that I couldn't run a church by myself. Been there, done that. Don't want to do it again. No. Uh, <laughs> but hear me. It's because God said to come and submit to Dr. Ed. And so we are learning to flow together. We are learning how to be a corporate body of Christ rather than just a singular head. He's the man that carries the vision. And so even if I hear from God, I submit what I'm hearing to him. Okay? But it's because God said to be here. I'm here because God said to be here. Not because I love the heat in Florida. Although it's nice some days. Some days it's, well done, thou good and faithful servant. No, no good and faithful, thou well done servant. <laughs> All right. So let's, <clears throat> Daniel had some unique insights into heaven and some of those who are motivated from there. Daniel's vision of God shows us how much he saw into heaven's governance. That's Daniel 2, 20 to 23, and Daniel 4, 13 to 17, verse 23, and verses 31 and 32. So let's look at some of this. Daniel 7, 13, 14, and 18. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of days. And they brought him near before him. And there was given unto him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. 
even though it may look like it's being squashed. Remember, God always has an ace, what I call an ace in the hole. It's called resurrection life. Okay? Sometimes we forget that in the midst of the circumstance. If something is of God, it cannot be killed unless he says so, and then usually it'll rise again, if it's God. And sometimes he has to do that to prove to us that he is the resurrection and the life. Not just for people, but for ministries and situations. Okay? Uh, his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Verse 18, But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Verses uh, Daniel 7, 21, 22, and 27, And I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until... By the way, why don't you do a study on the word until in Scripture? It's a time word in which God always intervenes when the until time comes. Comes, okay? Until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possess the kingdom. Listen, when that time comes, nothing can stop it. God is in the midst of getting you ready for that time now. Please hear that. Okay. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. By the way, there's not a word of doubt in anything I just read. It's a statement of fact. So the issue is, am I going to be in on it? Not is God going to do it? Or am I going to be ready for it? There's a probably the better question. A comparison between the vision and the interpretation. This is at the end of the tribulation, and this has a dual interpretation. It's important to remember that Jesus is always the primary interpretation of the term Son of Man. Always. But it's more than that. Jesus is the primary interpretation the second level of interpretation is the corporate son or the sons of God. He is the head of a body. Well, if the head is a son, what's the body? It ain't a nobody. All right. He came before the Ancient of Days. This term in the original means, and this is a very important term, Elder of Elders. God believes in true eldership. We're going to talk about that later in the course. What is a true elder? How does God develop them? They are the only eternal ministry. You don't find any apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, or teachers in heaven. But you're going to find elders. That's why elders, I am very reluctant to set them in quickly. Because I'm setting them into an eternal position. Yeah, let that one sink in, huh? Even Jesus, as the divine Son, has to approach the Father with reverence. One of the things that is not, has not been in the church since the charismatic move is reverence. God is going to return that to the church with the fear of the Lord. When he receives the government for the ages to come, it's given to him from the Father. 
The parallel type is found when Joseph is given authority in Egypt. Only when Pharaoh was in the throne was he over Joseph. It's a type and shadow. All government serves Jesus. Bottom line, period. All government. And the corporate son in the end. This we see in the passage when the vision is interpreted for Daniel. It would seem that at the same time the son received authority, the sons or the saints received it as well. You mean he hasn't got authority now? Not full authority. He's waiting for you and I to grow up. Yes. The whole earth groans and travails for what? Of who? Are they like the son? Is he the pattern son? Hello? I'm to become like him. He's not going to become like me, thank God. <laughs> and you better thank God he's not going to become like me too. <laughs> Are you hearing me? What's that? He does not have full authority because in this passage in Daniel, it was given to him at the same time as the saints possess the kingdom. The anointing for authority is fully poured on the head and it runs down. What's Psalm 132? 30, one, yeah. It runs down to the skirts of the garments. That means the, th the anointing that came on the head is going to come on the whole body. <laughs> Either that or he wasn't the high priest. And with the body. Listen, the body has got to become connected to the head. The body must become connected to the head. That's why we emphasize relationship. If he started in the garden with relationship and he ended in Revelation 22 with relationship, what's the book about? Relationship. And we've made it about doctrine, about intellect, about all that stuff. And has it worked? So maybe we should get back to the theme that he started. Okay? There's a specific time when it is to be received. Now listen, let me say this. Positionally, he has all authority. Okay? Again, it's the difference between the position, the process, and the possession. On earth, he said to the, the, the disciples, he said, I have power to call 12 legion of angels. But did he? He didn't use the power he had. And if we were Catholic, we would say, bingo. All right. <laughs> All right. I'm bad. All right. Now, Jesus manifests the government of God on earth as he did only that which he saw the Father do. This is absolutely essential both to understand and to ask God to bring us into. Because without this understanding, we will try and do things on our own. And that's what's got the church in a mess all along. It isn't that these men down through the ages, didn't have revelation, and God wasn't trying to build his church. He was, but they got stuck because once they thought they knew what God wanted, they began to do it from here, from the, their brain, rather than from their heart and their spirit in relationship. And that will trip you up every time. Okay? So in John 5, 19 
to 21 and verse 30. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son of Man can do how much? Nothing. We don't like the nothing realm, do we? We want to be doing something. The Son of Man can do nothing of himself, but what he... Oh, you mean he had an open heaven? He could see into the heavenlies. For whatsoever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son and shows him how much? All things that he himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. For as the Father raises up the dead, who raises the dead? Okay. And quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. I can of my own self, just in case you didn't hear me the first time, do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. Why? Do you know why justice in the earth is perverted? Because 99% of the judges seek their own will. Jesus' judgment was just because he sought not his own will, but the will of the Father. That's true justice. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. My judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. Isn't that powerful? God, get that into our spirits. Get it into our souls and change our minds from thinking that we can do something of ourselves to the point where we're willing to say, God, what do you want to do? And wait until he speaks. Daniel waited 21 days when God sent the message as soon as he prayed. We pray and expect the answer yesterday. There are some times when the purpose of God is to do a work in the waiting. The waiting room of God is the biggest room in God's house. Okay? Now, all of the above scripture point to Jesus not doing anything except what he saw done in the heavenlies. He did not speak except what the Father gave him commandment to speak. Because of this, we can safely say that Jesus manifests the government of God on earth. Do you know something? We need to spend more time studying the Gospels and studying the life of Jesus. We spend a lot of time in the epistles, we spend a lot of time in the Old Testament, and I believe in the Old Testament, you know I do. But if I don't find him, he said that all the scriptures, all the scriptures, not just certain ones, all the scriptures testify of him. So when I'm looking in the Old Testament, who should I be looking for? When I'm looking in the epistles, who should I be looking for? When I'm wondering how something that I'm hearing and instructed, instructs me in Scripture should be walked out, who should I be looking at? How did Jesus do it? You follow me? And if I don't know the life of Jesus, am I going to hear, be able to hear the Father say, this is the way, walk ye in it. Okay? First and foremost, he governed his own nature and will by that which was the will of the Father. I learn the government of God by letting God govern me. I learn what rebellion looks like when he instructs me and I rebel. I learn how to deal with that rebellion as I take it back to the Father. Then when I deal with it in the church, I do it right. Because I've learned on the testing ground. 
which is me. How Jesus dealt with his own nature was a manifestation of divine government. See why we need to study him? How Jesus dealt with men was a manifestation of divine government. How Jesus dealt with demons was a manifestation of the divine government. A few weeks ago, I ministered on the, um, what was it? Anyway, I, I, oh yeah, wilt thou be made whole? That message, that Sunday morning. And in my study, and I'd done this before, but I went through it again as I got ready for that message. In my study, before I'd come across scriptures that said, and Jesus healed those that were possessed of devils. And I thought, ah, 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 ah. cast them out. That's what I was taught. And then, of course, others he did cast out, didn't he? And I said, God, what's the difference? He said, study and find out. <laughs> so I prayerfully went to God and say, show me the difference. Do you know the word used, the word, the original words used there, when it says healed, absolutely means healed. I said, God, what does that mean? He said, I healed them and the demons couldn't stay. So some of the demonic possession was because of wounds of, that were not healing, things that weren't healing. Remember, sometimes he cast out the spirit of infirmity. Well, how does an infirmity manifest in a physical illness? Doesn't it? See, we've got to define everything by scripture rather than the dictionary or even experience. Then there are others that says he cast them out. And it means exactly that. He gave them the boot. So we need to, when I come to a situation, I need to say, Lord, why is this spirit here? So uh, there's always a choice how to do it. He may say, they have this sickness, pray for them. I'll heal them and the demon has to go. Or he may say, cast the thing out. I have to hear from heaven. How Jesus dealt with the religious was a manifestation of divine government. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> See, if, if he was the Word made flesh, then we've got to study him to know divine government. It's not an issue of methods, folks. It's an issue of knowing him who is the truth. And he is the, I don't want to call it benchmark, he's the, the plumb line by which everything else is measured. In Revelation 4, 1 to Revelation 5, 14, this is an extensive passage. It give us, gives us the longest insight into heaven in all of Scripture. It's here we get a glimpse in, into eternity and see how a government that Satan can no longer influence with accusation and with accusations functions. Do you know we can step into that place before Jesus comes? Because he's wanting to manifest his government in a people. The kingdom of God is where? Within you. Then can the kingdom come within me before it comes on earth? There's going to be a people that are what I have called transition ministry. Ministers during transition. I've done a whole series on that. It's on one of my websites. It's still working. Going on one of my websites. All right. The attendants around the throne, the 24 elders, okay? This is where we see that elders is an eternal position, not a temporary one. So I'm very, very cautious when I set in elders. And I've made a few mistakes. One of my first mistakes was setting in elders that were novices. Guess what? Church blew up. 
guess who got hurt the most? I'm here in spite of the church. I don't know. I honestly don't know. I wish I could tell you, but I don't know. Because if, if you set one in that isn't called to that. Okay. Huh? Yeah. Um, you know, and these are all things. We weren't taught these things in Bible school or in cemetery, a seminary. Okay? We weren't taught how to walk out what God says is available. We were taught doctrine. We were taught methods. And I often say God is not a Methodist. <laughs> but we were, t we were taught a lot of things. We were taught the toolbox, but we were not taught the scriptures. In fact, I left Bible school because there wasn't enough Bible in the school. And that's why I told them when they asked me to teach in Toronto at the college, I said, I'm going to write my own courses. This is my, these are the terms in which I'll teach for you. But they wanted me so much, they let me do it. And I got all my degrees by writing a thesis level. And all the courses from bachelor all the way through to doctor. By the time I left the school, I had written 36 courses, college level courses. Now I'm up to about 75. But see, the focus, my focus was not how to do. My focus was how can I bring people into a deeper relationship and a deeper understanding of who Jesus is and what he wants. That should be our focus. So you also have around the throne the seven spirits of God. The spirit of the Lord and I have a whole teaching that I do on this, but on the seven spirits, because listen, these are the anointings for the end time. It says, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon. These are anointings that rest upon a people. The spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel. It's not the spirit of psychiatry. It's the spirit of counsel. The spirit of might or the spirit of victory. That word might, one of the translations for it is victory. There is a spirit of victory that God can anoint his people with and they win every battle. Sometimes we don't win a battle because we don't access the spirit of might. And by the way, intercessors, this is yours. This is the anointing God wants to put upon intercessors. Okay? The spirit of might or the spirit of force. Now, that's not you using force. That's the force of God being used. The spirit of knowledge and the spirit of, there's an anointing that brings the fear of the Lord. First of all, let's define the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is I love him so much I don't want to grieve his heart. It's not, you don't straighten up, I'm going to whop you alongside the head. That's the fear of daddy, not the fear of the Lord. <laughs> but the fear of the Lord is an anointing. I can't, Remember this, I can't come into anything that God has for me without the anointing. And the anointing destroys, not breaks. Let's get that out of the way. The anointing destroys every yoke that it rests upon. The gifts of the Spirit and the ministries are the tools of God to do a work in you, getting you ready to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. And so many are caught up with the tools, they don't let the work get done. So, the four beasts, the lion, typical of the lion of the tribe of Judah and typical of the kingship of Jesus, Jesus manifested this in the Gospel of Matthew. 
the calf. In Ezekiel uh, 1 and 10, it's the face of the ox. In Ezekiel 10, 14, it's the face of a cherub. We haven't got time to go into this, but there's obviously teaching around it all. In Revelation 4 and 7, it's the face of a calf. It typifies the anointing of the servant. How many know that if you're going to serve right, you need an anointing? And Jesus manifested it in the Gospel of Luke. One of the, the primary words, or set of words in the Gospels, or in the Gospel of Mark is immediately, suddenly. It's governed by the suddenlies of a God. Because it shows the servant, the Lord Jesus Christ. The man face of a man. In all the passages it is the man or humanity. Jesus manifested pure humanity. It says that he laid aside everything else in Philippians and became subject, and became a servant, became a man. And he manifested what a man should be. That's his favorite title for himself was not son of God but Son of man. And by the way, it isn't the Son of God that's coming again to get you. It's the Son of man. When the Son of man shall appear in the clouds with all his holy angels. Come on now. I heard someone say the other day, and, and I was, uh, I didn't say anything out loud, but inside I said no. They said, when Jesus died, that was the end of the Son of man. No, it wasn't. Because he's come, He's sitting on the throne right now and he's coming back as the Son of Man. Okay. Now, in heaven, yes. When God placed the crowns on his head, his coronation, is that when he becomes the Son of God? No, he became the Son of God when he raised from the dead. Okay. Acts 13. Paul's preaching a message. But I mean for the Son of Man, that would be, they would call himself the Son of God when he coronated his king? No, because he's already coronated when he comes back in Revelation 19, isn't he? Okay. And he's coming back as the Son of Man with the crown on his head. You like to mess with me. I am messing with everybody's doctrine. I am an equal opportunity messer. <laughs> All right. This is a type of the man, Christ Jesus. Jesus manifested true, pure humanity in the Gospel of Luke. Remember in Philippians it said he laid aside. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself. That made himself is emptied himself. He emptied himself of all his rights and privileges. It isn't that he couldn't have done it. He told them, I could call 12 legions of angels and they would come. But he submitted everything to the Father and didn't do anything but what the Father said. Okay? The eagle, in all the passages that describes the four beasts, it's the same. This is a type of the divine son. And Jesus manifested it in the books, plural, written by John. Not just in the Gospel of John, but in all the books that John wrote. The eagle, the divine son, is prominent. So, the four beasts, and here we have the several listings. The Ezekiel 1, 5, 7, and 10 listing. The, the listing in Revelation. And then you have... Angels, 10,000 times 10,000. So let's, let's look at this nice little box I have up here. Do these listings denote a progression toward the manifestation of the Gospels or the Word made flesh in a corporate people? If I'm to become like Him, then I am to become the Word made flesh. Let me say this, in your life, God may 
give an emphasis to one of the Gospels, and that may be your emphasis. That may be the major emphasis of your life. Okay? It's not that we have to manifest them all. It's that we have to show forth an aspect of his nature that he's called us to show forth. And it's possible to show forth perfectly. But I must let the word become flesh. How does the word become flesh? The word becomes flesh by God speaking into me and me allowing it to do its work. And we walk in it. Okay. It is the four beasts and the 24 elders that sing this new song in Revelation 5 and 8. And they're out of. Now, the four beasts and the 24 elders, they're the ones that sing it, right? It says, Thou hast redeemed us unto thyself out of every kindred. How many kindreds? How many family lines? A lot more than we know, right? What about how many languages? There's more than 28, right? Out of every people group and out of every nation. How many nations? Right now there's, what, 190 some or 210 or something. So it can't be four or 28 literal beings. It's speaking of 28 companies of people. And they're all redeemed. I think we've got to get a bigger picture of what God's doing than we have currently. Okay? Some will have it worked in them in the Ezekiel 1 order. Some will have the Ezekiel 10 order. Some will have the Revelation 4 order. Divine order is worked into a people. So let's sum up tonight's lesson. We've seen the different biblically recorded scenes into heaven. Each one has shown us aspect of heaven's governance that was not seen in the others. That's why when you study anything in Scripture, go from generations to revolutions. I mean, Genesis to Revelation. Okay? Don't stop along the way. We've got into trouble in our churches and denominations because we've stopped somewhere along the way and majored on a certain aspect and not got off it. God is delivering us from that and bringing us into balance. Considering all of them gives us a composite account of heaven's governance. Our next lessons will begin to show how God unveiled the revelation of his governance down through history. What God does in the end time, now catch this, because we're living, I believe, in this day. I believe I'm going to see it, and I'm 76. Okay? So don't give up hope, folk. All right? What God does in the... Of course, I'm going to live to 120, at least. So... <laughs> What God does in the end time is bring all of these together in a manifestation of fullness that we cannot yet comprehend. Listen, when he reveals the fullness of himself, no one is going to be able to say, I didn't have opportunity. There's coming a revelation of God from heaven that is beyond anything we can comprehend at this point in time. A symphony, consider this illustration, a symphony is usually four movements. Each movement has a character of its own and could stand alone as a musical composition. So the first movement was from creation to Noah, the movement to the covenant of the promised. The second was Noah to Moses, the movement of the patriarchs or a movement of faith. Moses to Jesus, the movement of the law, the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And then Christ to the second coming, the grand finale. The kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ, Revelation 11:15. It's Daniel's stone becoming the kingdom that fills the whole earth. Those two are synonymous. 
The final movement has elements of, of the other three within it, but ends in a crescendo greater than all the other movements. What is happening in the end time is that the grand finale is greater and a summation of all the former movements. The kingdom government that God is orchestrating will be a merging of all that has come before and yet be greater both negatively and positively than anything that's been seen up till that time. Consider this, the day of the Lord, and catch this, it has nothing to do with 24 hours. The day of the Lord will be the manifestation of the triumph of the cross over all the powers of the enemy or the final crescendo of the symphony. The kingdom of darkness will have come to maturity with the enemy of our souls possessing and bringing the tares, the children of the wicked one, to maturity. By the way, that tares come to maturity first. That's what we're seeing going on. The very fact that, the, that they're coming to maturity should excite us because right on the heels of that, right on the heels of that, right on the heels of that, the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ will come to maturity and God will triumph setting up his governance on the earth. Revelation 10 and 12, the triumph of God's kingdom. Revelation 12 to 18, the enemy's last ditch effort to keep rulership of the kingdoms of this world and he loses. <laughs> the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. So let's talk to Father. We better, yeah. Heavenly King, would you so impart into our being your vision of victory that we move and function from the place of your victory. So infuse our thinking with your kingdom mindset that we think, pray, function, and minister from there. Your kingdom come in our individual lives. Your kingdom come in our corporate lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Glory.